connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. and welcome to Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Doug Maynard, your host for the next hour. And I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but today is, uh, today, November 20th, is National Child Day, or as the United Nations calls it, the United Nations Universal Children's Day. Uh, November 20th, we recognize this day because this is the day that uh, Canada signed on to the United Nations uh, Charter on the Rights of the Child. Um, and today, just as a, in honor of National Child Day, I've invited a special guest to, to help me co-host this episode. So it's my pleasure to introduce my co-host today. Uh, before we get started, my co-host is uh, Lucas Maynard. Lucas is uh, is 12 years old. He's in grade seven at Emily Carr Middle School in Ottawa, and he happens to share the same last name as me because he's actually my son, I guess. I should admit that. All right, over to you, Lucas. Uh, since we are live, we want to remind everyone, you do have the opportunity to type questions into the question box at uh, any time. We will check for questions throughout the session, so please don't feel you need to wait until the end of the presentation before you start typing questions. Go ahead and put them in as you think of them. Also, feel, feel free to share your thoughts on Twitter, and be sure to tag us at Child Health Can. And before we get started uh, to, uh, into, into today's session, I did want to thank uh, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals for supporting our webinar program. Uh, they've been a supporter of Children's Healthcare Canada for many years, supporting our work in patient safety, quality improvement, and family engagement. And uh, once again, Mallinckrodt's going to be joining us at our annual conference. It's actually coming up very soon, just a couple weeks away, uh, on December 8th, uh, 8th to 10th, uh, to be held in Ottawa. Registration, of course, is still open. The program's available on, available on our website. And as part of that uh, conference, Mallinckrodt will be hosting a breakfast session focused on, on December 9th, on the Monday, uh, focused on successful and unsuccessful e equipment introductions. from, And they're going to be looking at it from a number of perspectives, uh, from uh, the administrator, patient safety perspective, perspective, departmental perspectives, et cetera, and including who should be in the assessment team and team engagement strategies to optimize patient safety when you're implementing new devices. Uh, so hopefully we'll, uh, hopefully we'll see lots of you, lots of our, our virtual audience that we see every week here. Hopefully we'll see you in person at the conference. And uh, if you are there, take uh, we hope you take time to visit uh, our partners at Mallinckrodt. Today we are talking about collaborating to eliminate preventable harm, a, a report from Canadian members of SPS. SPS, or Solutions for Patient Safety, is an international network of more than 135 children's hospitals who share the vision that no child will ever experience serious harm while admitted to a hospital. They believe that by putting aside competition and sharing safety success and failures, everyone can achieve their goals faster. And joining us today to tell us more, we'll, we will hear from three of, Canadians, of the Canadian hospitals that are participating in this collaborative. Jane Palmer is a registered nurse and healthcare leader with ex expertise in quality and patient safety. She is now director of quality safety and patient experience with the IWK Health Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Jennifer Ellis is the director of quality and safety at CHEO, where she has oversight for infection prevention and control, patient safety, clinical risk management, occupation, occupational health and safety, environmental services, as well as leadership for key quality and safety initiatives. Dr. David Crury is a pediatric intensivist, medical doc director of patient safety, and is an intensivist in pediatric intensive care unit at CHEO in Ottawa, Ontario. Barb Jennings is an RN with 25 years clinical and operations experience in pediatric acute care. 
She is now Senior Advisor of Joyce Center in Health for Healthcare Innovations at McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario. So it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to you, Barb. Good morning and welcome everyone. Um, I, my screen is now stuck. I don't know what the problem is. You can't advance uh, your slides? No, nope. and I, I have been able to for the last 10 minutes. Uh, if you just click uh, click on the center of the screen, like right where your title is there. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction to Solutions for Patient Safety, um, better known as SPS. Um, certainly, in terms of SPS, the mission is working together to eliminate serious harm across all children's hospitals, and the vision is that it's all kids, all hospitals, all safe. There are a few key guiding principles um, that have contributed to the success of network hospitals. These are one being um, a leadership commitment, um, a focus on collaboration and not competition, an, um, an all teach, all learn mindset, an expectation that uh, network hospitals will focus on building a culture of safety and recognizing that employee safety is fundamental to patient safety. I really like this drawing. It's a great uh, demonstration and summary of the SPS journey to date. You can see through the colored circles um, areas of focus and um, you can tell by looking at each one of those the great success that the network has had in moving forward with this journey. Um, certainly in terms of, again, knowledge sharing and a focus on learning, um, the importance of collaboration and network and relationship building, um, the opportunity for guidance and support um, through collaboration, and um, it most importantly is reducing harm to children. And if you look at that number, it's pretty phenomenal. And obviously um, the amount of money saved is also significant across the network. This is a great visual of the children's hospitals who are members of the network. Um, as it indicates, there are now over 140 children's hospitals, um, which is a huge increase from the eight original hospitals. And um, more recently, in the last three to four years, uh, we've seen an increase in Canadian hospitals joining the network, which is really exciting. This is um, uh, a graph really showing um, the SPS focus, and each of those blue areas are what are called hacks. And hacks are hospital-acquired conditions, and those are conditions that are most common across all of our hospitals. And based on those hacks, um, the network has three key um, goals uh, heading into um, 2021, and that is to re reduce serious safety events that occur in our organization. Um, two is decrease the number of um, harms that occur based on the hacks with clear targets and goals. And lastly is to prevent um, harm to our employees and our physicians. So now I'm going to show you the diagram with a few other arrows, and I know this one um, tends to be a little bit uh, crazy making, um, but it really demonstrates that, yes, there are all the half dark blue lines underneath, but in order for us to improve, um, we really need to also be able to focus on what are called culture wave um, approaches. and. These are initiatives that are, um, you know, relate to the specific hacks, and it's kind of like a broad um, um, 
cultural foundation that you really need to have in order to ensure you have success um, in terms of your hack rate, um, ensuring that you have reliability. So it really is that combination approach that is key to the success of the network. And then the network is divided um, in terms of the, of the work into a number of um, um, areas of improvement. On, the, on my far left, discovery, and those are new hacks um, and new partnerships and new work that is being, um, uh, being utilized and um, being considered in terms of how does it relate to SPS. In the main box, the active network improvement piece is where the members do most of their work, um, primarily in the aviator um, area where you are actively working on your hacks um, and you are actively working on your air prevention and culture work. Many network hospitals also participate in pioneer hacks, and those are new hacks that are just beginning to be explored and tested, um, which eventually will move into aviator hacks. And then lastly, there are orbiting hacks, and these are hacks that have been around since the beginning of SPS, and for many organizations, they have managed to reach and sustain the center line for many, many years, and they no longer report um, data on or orbiting hacks, although certainly new members do. And then the explorer is really looking to the future and what other um, harms can we focus on and, um, and develop. So the key in terms of the, um, the work is building reliability, and, and I think this is SPS so successful. It really is setting the standard. What is the best practice? Um, ensuring that you teach the standard. And lastly, making sure you do audits to, to um, ensure that you are actually following the standard. And this is really makes, this really makes SPS um, uh, successful in the work that they do. And then on top of the hack work, I've mentioned culture and, and safety culture. And so, again, it really is um, an important focus. And once you've joined SPS, within your first two years, you spend a year in training and focusing on, you know, learning about error prevention and building a foundation in culture. And these are, again, key if you go back to that diagram with the dark blue lines and the light blue lines, that complementary process that really is going to help um, eliminate serious harm in your organization. And then here's yet another example where you can see very clearly the um, huge in, um, hack performance improvements um, across the network. And then lastly, um, these are uh, American dollars, but certainly it gives you a sense of the cost of um, these harms and potential cost savings. And sometimes that's really um, important in terms of helping staff understand, you know, the, the other impact related to harm outside of, of the patient and the family. And then lastly, this um, evidence brief was published in May, and I think for anyone who's interested in understanding more about SPS, um, I would suggest you take a look at this brief. I will pause now if there are any questions, or shall we hold them till the end? There aren't any questions at this point, but uh, it's uh, certainly my chance to remind the audience to type those questions in as you think of them. Don't feel you need to uh, wait until the end, because uh, we may take questions at any point uh, throughout the session. So uh, so please uh, go ahead with the rest of your presentation, Barb. Okay. So I am happy to share with you um, our SPS journey at McMaster Children's Hospital. Um, we are a large children's hospital located in Hamilton, um, serving a community of 2.3 million people. 
we are a children's hospital that is part of a large um, healthcare organization, Hamilton Health Sciences. Um, and as you can see, we have 115 budgeted beds, 12 PICU beds, and 70 NICU beds, um, a large um, pediatric eMERGE and ambulatory service. Um, and we joined SPS in 2017 and joined the culture wave in 2018. And so this is really a picture of uh, a few of our, uh, our our nurses who support our work in in um, SPS and patient safety. Um, and this is really a quick uh, overview of our journey. So prior to joining SPS, we did spend some time in 2016 really looking at what was going on in our organization related to patient safety um, in terms of what was the work we were doing and started to focus on CLAB-C, which is central line associated bloodstream infections, and to get an understanding of what was our current state. And it also gave us an opportunity to um, link our work with our CQI work, but also to gather our baseline data. And we felt that year in preparation was helpful for us when we actually joined SPS in 2017. We spent our first six to eight months really focusing on one hack, CLAB C, and then um, once we were feeling comfortable with where we were at, we added the, the um, surgery site infection bundle work um, next. Um, in 2018, as I said, we joined the, um, we expanded the number of hacks we were working on, and we joined the culture wave. We did our air prevention training, and um, we started to work through the pieces of that that were expected in terms of um, getting our serious safety event team, starting our harm index tool, um, doing our staff training, um, and, and really focusing on our data. And then in 2019, we continued our training, and our focus has been really how could we start to look at moving into other hacks, being careful not to, um, you know, want to take the focus off areas where we were already being successful and, and really moving forward with a planned approach in terms of our hack expansion. Um, certainly in terms of looking at what other things that we can do to keep the conversation um, alive across the house related to our hack work and our error prevention work. Um, we also implemented our safety coach role um, and are doing some pre-work on uh, pressure injury hacks. We are a CQI hospital, and this was certainly one of the challenges we had early on. Um, you know, how do we link our SPS work with our CQI work. And we found um, actually there was great synergy. I've got four blue checks there where there were pretty easy wins in terms of um, where we could um, link our SPS work in terms of ensuring we had conversations at our daily huddle, um, ensuring we had our leadership support. Um, how do we ensure that our bundle work um, became part of our standard work? and process observation is really the same as bundle reliability. So it was really trying to help staff understand they were two different processes, but they all came together as one in our daily operations. And then this is um, it's a busy slide, but I wanted to show just sort of a rough outline of it's, it's, a, it's a lot of, of work but it's certainly a lot of very small steps as you go through um, looking at the bundle elements and then adjusting what do you need to do in your organization to meet those bundled um, those bundle elements. And so again, it just demonstrates the work that needs to be done and the time commitment it takes to actually roll out a hack. And then with all our hacks, we do a couple of things. One is um, we make sure we do a launch, and that launch is really, um, you know, the implementation and making sure that everyone is clear from an education perspective and a planning perspective about the work that we're doing. And that's just a fun example of our Cloud C launch. 
And then the other picture is really, again, linking us with our, um, our huddle board. And there are two nurses in that picture, and they are talking about the Clab C hack and, um, and the focus of the, that bundle on our um, CQI board. Another example I wanted to share was surgical site infections, and I think it's really important to look at where you can link your hack work um, into the organization and other work you're doing. Um, our infectious diseases team were already working on antimicrobial um, stewardship, and they had developed really great guidelines in terms of, for surgeons, in terms of prophylaxis. And so we um, connected with them, and we also linked our Nesquip database, which is the pediatric surgical database, and we pulled that in and pulled our um, SSI bundle into that work in terms of looking at what did we need to do to meet the bundle. And so, again, it's a good example of building on work that you're already doing and incorporating your SPS work into that. I did allude to the importance of patient and family engagement, and this is an example. Um, this one is for our PIVI work, um, but certainly we have involved patients and family in terms of their CLAB-C work, um, and, and many families, particularly those of our long-term patients, um, are actually quite able to do a bundle um, process observation themselves, and, and so we have some fun with that as well. Uh, but certainly families are very involved in supporting um, our CLABC bundle. Um, certainly we've done a lot of work with the SSI in terms of preparing families around clean skin. And then um, the best example really is PIVI and getting families to actively work with us in terms of um, monitoring and observing for PIVI. And again, this is a kind of a busy diagram, but it really is a flow diagram that shows all of the hacks listed across the top. And the darker colors are where we are at as a team. And um, obviously with a goal of implementing all hacks eventually, um, and certainly getting to the center line. So we use this as an update in terms of where we're at. Um, Here's an example of our culture wave training. Uh, again, we made it mandatory for everyone. Uh, we ran two or three sessions a week, and we were we had 15 uh, trainers, seven of whom were physicians and seven who were non-physicians. So we are pretty excited about our culture wave training. And uh, we have large posters uh, with the behavior-based expectations up in all the clinical areas. And all staff have a little handy-dandy um, pocket card to remind them of their error prevention training and behavior expectations. We just recently implemented our safety coach role, and that's a role that's really important in terms of supporting and sustaining your error prevention and culture training work. And these are just examples in terms of their observations and their standard um, work. And then lastly, just a brief overview of all of the things we have implemented um, in the past year related to our serious safety of view review team. We go through all of the SORs and develop learnings um, on any SORs that we determine to be a serious safety event tool, um, serious safety event. Um, we have day since graphs and we share all of our data um, as well monthly at our data huddle. Um, and this is an example, we call it Thursday Threads. We have a large data huddle with 30 plus people who come. We review the highlights from the month. Um, we talk about what change processes need to happen, where are their barriers, um, and we also take the time to celebrate our successes. I will hand it over to Jane. Thank you, Barb. Uh, great presentation. I did want to just check in um, with uh, Dr. Creary. I did see you, you, you did join a little bit late. I just want to make sure we can hear you. If you can just uh, do a quick sound check for us. Hello. Uh, yeah, this is David Creary. 
All right. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure we could hear you. So we're all set when uh, when we get uh, through uh, through Jane's presentation. I did want to mention there was a, a quick question that came in. Uh, the question was, what is a level three SOR, uh, Barb, if you just wouldn't uh, mind just clarifying that. So in our occurrence um, reporting system, a level three SOR is an SOR where there has been moderate harm. And so we use that as the cutoff in terms of reviewing that 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 incident. And then we use the SPS um, algorithms in terms of reviewing it. Was there a deviation from practice? And then um, making a decision on whether it was a serious safety event or not. Much. Um, and I did want to, and it's interesting, I mean, we've you know, I've spoken with you about the, coming to this presentation and, and what we're going to talk about. When I see it on the screen, there is a wealth of acronyms, a really quite an unbelievable wealth of acronyms. And I do, I do know the audience that we have quite a diverse range of uh, expertise in this area. So if anyone does have any questions about what the acronyms mean, please don't uh, don't hesitate to just put it in the question box, and we'll make sure we clarify what any of the acronyms mean for you. Yeah, so, it's uh, like learning a new language. Yeah, it totally is. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to head out to Halifax to hear from Jane Palmer and the experience at the IWK Health Center. Over to you, Jane. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, if you happen to be out here on the East Coast uh, with me. Uh, so just a little bit about um, the IWK, for those of you who don't know, we are located in Halifax. Um, we do provide um, tertiary care services to the uh, maritime provinces. So while our catchment area in terms of population uh, might be relatively small, we have a large uh, geographical area that we cover. Uh, we have over a couple hundred acute care beds. Um, we have close to 3,000 staff. Uh, and I won't read through all of these, but suffice it to say, uh, we are a, busy, a very busy um, tertiary care center um, that also does provide community and primary uh, care services as well. So what I would like to really emphasize today is that the impact of joining the Solutions for Patient Safety Network has had a tremendous impact uh, to us uh, as an organization, particularly our patient safety, uh, patient experience, and staff safety um, approach. It really has fundamentally changed the way that we're looking at uh, patient and staff safety, and uh, essentially our program has been completely transformed and restructured, focusing on those best practices of the network. Uh, so the IWK is now committed formally to becoming a high reliability organization, and I'm going to talk just briefly about that in the next slides, but it really is the underpinning of our safety work. Um, and I think the most important thing I'd like to share in terms of the results that we've seen over the last uh, three years is that our serious safety event and harm rates have been significantly reduced since joining the network, particularly within the last year, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. So this notion of high reliability, um, there's probably varied um, uh, understanding around what that is across the country in terms of how that relates to healthcare. But really what it boils down to is an organizational culture and the processes that profoundly reduce system failures and effectively respond when failures occur. So really, uh, we're talking about there are five um, basic principles of high reliability vig vigilance. So um, basically, if you see something, how we're going to deal with it, a reluctance to simplify, uh, a preoccupation with failure, and that may be a little bit counterintuitive. We uh, certainly like to, we do need to and like to focus on the positive, but we also need to be concerned about where things can go wrong and focus on that. Deference to expertise, this really speaks to the fact that the people doing the work often have the best solutions. And then resilience. So how do we bounce back as an organization when something doesn't go quite the way we planned or we do end up unfortunately harming a patient? How are we resilient in learning from that? So the characteristics of a high reliability organization, um, the role of leadership uh, and commitment uh, of the senior leadership of an organization cannot be overstated. Um, here at the IWK, we have a very strong commitment from the CEO and basically all of our executive leaders for the work that we're doing related to becoming a high reliability organization. Um, and it very much is on their radar on a day-to-day -day basis, and I feel very fortunate um, uh, that that's the case. Uh, the safety culture piece, again, it is critical. Um, you need to build that culture of trust that fosters reporting, which in turn 
uh, fosters how you're going to or or gives some direction how you're going to improve. Um, just culture, ensuring that the culture of the organization is such that while you're holding people accountable, you have to really understand what's at play when things happen and not just blaming it on simple human error. Uh, and then robust process improvement. So, um, the, the methodologies of process improvement and quality improvement are very much tied into the work that we do, um, how we train staff and how we spread those learnings when things don't go quite as planned. So I'll talk a little bit about our journey uh, with the SPS network. Some of this might be a little bit hard to see, but we essentially partnered with um, SPS beginning in um, the spring of 2016. Uh, and I have to say that, you know, we just kind of went in two feet first. We weren't 100% sure what we were getting into. Um, it took us some time to understand what the network was about, how it was going to benefit us and understand um, what other folks were seeing in terms of results. We did start our work um, quite early in terms of looking at CLABC prevention. And we launched this work formally. Um, uh, Barb talked a little bit about the, the bundles in her presentation. We did launch that formally with our uh, hematology oncology group in the fall of um, 2016-17, and we certainly had some learnings for, from that in terms of how we could have better positioned that within um, the organization and particularly within the team to get better uptake. And we did learn some lessons along the way. The next piece that we really um, looked at was, as Barb said, we had um, received really a whole year's worth of training of what we call culture wave training. Um, and this was really fundamental in terms of, as I said earlier, how we were shifting our structures and our philosophies around um, our safety program. Um, and it really did transform after that year of, of intense training around culture. It really did transform the way that we did our work. Um, through all of this, we were spreading our um, CLABSI prevention bundle in our NICU-PICU. We implemented a new root cause analysis uh, methodology, which again, um, we learned through the network. Um, and then our next step was really um, looking at um, the air prevention training. So what are those tips and techniques um, that uh, direct care providers can use in the environment that is going to reduce the chances of them making a mistake. As we all know, humans will make mistakes. We need to expect that. And so what are the things in practice, the tools and techniques we can use to mitigate or minimize that? The other piece that I really want to highlight is the fact that we had a um, we launched what we call a daily safety brief or a daily safety call. This is very much part and parcel of the, what I, we would call the culture wave, of part of the suite of culture wave um, methodologies. We started that very early on and um, we just celebrated our third anniversary of doing that and we have not missed a day since we implemented November 1st of 2016. Um, we launched a safety coach program. Barb talked a little bit about that. And I'm going to go into more detail about that further down the road. Uh, and then really the rest of our journey has been around the spread. How do we spread these lo um, learnings across uh, our healthcare system, how do we leverage our internal partnerships and um, uh, all the in existing structures to ensure this work moves along. Uh, we A lot of focus on leadership, as I said earlier, leadership is key to this and there again is a formal suite of um, methods around how we can, how leaders can help support a culture of safety. Um, and then uh, what we're looking at right now is we, we have our CLABC prevention bundle pretty much rolled out across the organization. We are in the midst of um, implementing unplanned extubation and pressure injury bundles. Those are um, early, but we've kicked them off. And um, we uh, really, the next thing we've done is we've launched a good catch program uh, just this fall. So high reliability is part of our Aspire or what we would call our strategic plan here at the IWK. If you can look at that middle section with the green, um, there's several components that um, tie to becoming a high reliability organization that we formally track and trend as part of our performance scorecard and part of our QIP. Um, of note in terms of our serious safety events, 
Um, our baseline performance for the fiscal year previous was five. We are sitting at zero this fiscal year. We've now gone seven full months without a serious safety event, uh, and we're very pleased about that. So this is all about culture. This cannot be overstated enough. In order to achieve these breakthrough results, the SPS network hospitals really are employing cultural transformation strategies of other high reliability industries, such as aviation, nuclear power, um, et cetera. And these industries over time have been able to significantly reduce harm uh, by focusing on reliability. And the culture transformation must happen at all levels, from the ground up and from the top down. Senior leaders and board of directors um, at SPS Network Hospitals are challenged to transform their organizational culture and set the expectation of personal accountability for safety from all levels. And again, the importance of leadership is key. So really, when you talk about changing culture, we're talking about changing behaviors. And what's important here, what we've learned along the way, is that th is the need to mind the gap. Um, obviously, leaders um, at all levels have an expectation uh, or sorry, and a, um, a responsibility to set expectations and to ensure that staff providing care are educated and have the skills to do so. However, we all know that sometimes um, work, we, what we call work as imagined versus what's work is really happening. Uh, there's always drift. You put a policy in place that is based, evidence-based practice, it's based on the best safety practices. You roll that education out to staff and you teach them, but sometimes practices drift. And that's where really the reinforcing and building of accountability comes in um, through local, both local leadership and at the senior level around how are we minding that gap? How are we ensuring that what we put in place to keep patients safe is actually happening at the front line? So I call this our IWK Culture Shift Toolbox. Um, Part of the SPS network is teaching um, network members in various strategies um, to ensure their culture is is such that um, you're able to uh, reduce preventable harm. We now use a standardized classification and management for our safety events. We now have committee structures that enable accountability. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my next slide. Uh, we do formalized cause analysis events, so we do the root cause analysis, which is a deep dive. We also do a common cause analysis, which is a yearly look back at what were the common themes uh, of all those events that we studied, and we, we Pareto those so that we understand what we need to focus on. And then something else that we're just starting to roll out is a parent cause analysis, which is really more of a real-time analysis of the people involved in an event um, related to what may have contributed to, to the event. So an example is, is that we've just rolled out uh, a parent cause analysis for unplanned extubations. And really, it's just a checklist that when an unplanned extubation happens, the care team is able to go through the checklist of what they think the contributing factors were. And that's really helpful in terms of tracking and trending and, and figuring out what solutions we need to put in place. Air prevention training, I've talked about that. The safety coach program, I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, in my uh, slides uh, because it's a very key piece to our program. Leadership training and just culture for former leaders. That's all part and parcel of um, our toolbox. So our safety program structure, um, we do have uh, what we call a safety event advisory council. And this is populated of uh, senior um, administrative and physician leaders uh, that basically are, are making a decision when we think um, something meets the threshold of the serious safety event and what we should do with that. Uh, we also have a center-wide quality and patient safety uh, committee, and that is a little bit broader. It's actually quite a large committee, and that usually is director level and up. Uh, and we also have a patient and family representative on that committee. And then we have our medical advisory committee, um, which is connected to all of all of this work that we're doing. Um, and really, it's it, from my perspective, this is really our accountability structure in terms of ensuring that um, not only that um, appropriate analysis happens from safety events, but that the learning is being spread appropriately across the organization. So uh, what I would tell you as of today is that um, we have 164 uh, trained safety coaches in our environment. That number continues to climb um, on a monthly basis. We have... Um, over 600, close to 700 staff now train in air prevention techniques. And as I said, we have three, right now we have three hospital-acquired condition teams 
focusing on CLABSI, pressure injuries, and unplanned extubations, and that is in alignment with what the SPS network um, priorities are. And we made an intentional decision to, to keep to that because this is where we're seeing some of our harm. I'm proud to say that we've had a 73% reduction in our CLABSI rate um, since we started the work. Um, to me, that is quite impressive. And we've also had a 70% reduction in our serious safety event rate. Um, and I guess in terms of whole numbers, which are never uh, as good as a rate, um, we've essentially reduced our serious safety events from 14 uh, down to 10, down to 5. And now this fiscal year, we're sitting at zero. So we've realized uh, quite an impact in a very short period of time. This is just an example of, um, we have a wonderful project manager that works with us in terms of our data. Uh, and this really is just looking over time at what we would call our serious harm events. And this is, di this is different than serious safety events, but uh, certainly if you look at that graph, um, we have had a significant reduction. You will see that in June, um, we did have a bit of a, a tick, uh, an uptick, um, and that is primarily related to um, some CLABSIs that we've seen um, in our NICU, and we think that there are some, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty confident in what some of the contributing factors are there, uh, and we're looking at that. So again, much like Barb showed you, this is the progress of the hospital, what we call the hospital acquired conditions. Uh, and what we've been focusing on, we've uh, had a lot of focus on CLABSI. Um, and uh, we already were, were pretty much doing the practices around surgical safety um, infections. And so uh, really right now we're focusing on uh, the outcome data there. I won't go through all of these individually, but now we're focusing on um, looking at the bundle implementation and process data around falls, pressure injuries, and unplanned extubation. Uh, and certainly we also have um, some work going on around our employee safety, which you'll see is DART and TRIR, which is days away, restricted tr or transferred. And, and then the other one is around uh, time away. Um, so all that to say, um, we, there's a number of components in, to that, and sometimes you know you have to. You, you, it's it's almost like a push pull. Um, sometimes we have to we go out um, and try to implement something, and then we have to pull back a little bit based on what's going on around with local teams in the organization. But for the most part, uh, over time we've been quite successful. What I would like to spend uh, pretty much the remainder of the time on is around uh, our safety coach program. We made the conscious decision early in our journey early in our journey with SPS that we felt the safety coach um, piece to this was uh, a key component. Safety coaches are, are really, they're, they're care providers. They're not managers, they're not directors, they're care providers or team members who will observe work behaviors and provide peer-to-peer -peer support to reinforce organizational safety practices and behavioral changes. So the error prevention techniques that um, we've spoken about earlier, those are really what we call our expected behavioral expectations. And there's certain tips and techniques within each of those behavioral expectations um, that we want people to be employing in practice. Uh, and the safety coaches uh, get training on um, what these techniques are and how to coach and mentor them um, in the care areas or in the, during the provision of care. Uh, we have a formalized program, and uh, we have um, a safety coach lead, and we also have a safety coach uh, community of practice that meets monthly in supporting each other. Um, and we've had a fair amount of success with the program. There's more that we want to do, um, but we see the value in it. And are, we're not 100% there yet, um, but we certainly think that the Safety Coach program has really um, been the driver of some of the results that we're seeing. Part of that is uh, the um, what we call our, our safety boards or our safety coach boards. And we have these throughout the organization, and they're growing in number. Um, since we started the program, and really it's an area so that staff can visualize the activity of the safety coaches, uh, have a better understanding of what their role is and how they can be helpful to them and provide mentorship to them in terms of safety, um, and it just provides a nice visual and highlights also to the public um, and our patients and families that we are, um, it's a tangible example of what we're doing around safety. 
So just briefly, I've already mentioned some of this, but we did launch our program in, two, in March of 2018. We, we did have the opportunity to leverage a provincial nursing uh, strategy grant that essentially allowed us to um, backfill um, some nurses to attend a very focused um, uh, workshop on, on uh, patient safety. Um, and we did partner with professional practice to design this eight-hour workshop. Um, and since then, uh, we've been able to sustain it. I think when we went out with it early, we had to get buy-in. And I think part of that buy-in was a bit of a give. So we are paying for your folks to come um, for the eight-hour workshop to backfill them. We've since stopped that. We don't need to do that. The, engage the level of engagement that we have is such that people are willing to backfill and send their staff to our education. And as I said, they are inter integral to the teaching and modeling of the error prevention techniques. Uh, I think I've pretty much touched on the rest of it, except to say that we did create an internal safety coach marketing video. Um, it's about a, I guess, a six-minute video, uh, and it highlights uh, safety, actual safety coaches, what they see the value is, um, talks a bit about the program, and then we have our senior, some of our senior administrative staff and our CEO making comments in the video, and it's been great in terms of marketing. We have now have a quarterly newsletter called Coaching Connections, and I said we have a community of practice. Uh, one thing that we did do this year in terms of culture, we formally launched a good catch program. I know many of you across the country probably uh, already do this, but for us at the IWK, it was something we've been wanting to do, and we um, we finally launched it in the fall of this year. And uh, what it looks like really is, is a certificate is given um, to staff that are making good catches, and I try to personally um, deliver those. Sometimes I can't always do that, um, but it really is trying to uh, engage folks with trying to get them to understand the importance of, of reporting and how that affects patient safety. So just to um, close, I think that there's some important lessons learned that I'd like to pass on. Um, I think that I've already said this, uh, but the SPS network really has well possessioned us in reducing preventable harm. We are seeing the results. Um, becoming an HRO with the goal of eliminating preventable harm needs to be priority of executive leadership to be successful. That is absolutely um, a non-negotiable piece to this. And as I said earlier, we, we I feel very fortunate here that we have that. Shifting this culture takes time, persistence, and resiliency on behalf of all leadership and staff. Um, I can tell you as a type A person and someone who likes to see results quicker rather than uh, perhaps in a more slow fashion, it's been frustrating at some times, but I guess persistence is the key. And over time, if you're persistent, you're going to get results. Um, I would also say expect some challenges and roadblocks. Um, that is, that's natural. I think it happens in, in much of what we do, particularly around uh, quality improvement. But you need to expect it and not get frustrated and actually use it as an opportunity. Um, internal partnerships are critical and you need to leverage those. Uh, as an example, I have been able to leverage the uh, relationship with professional practice to make those connects between practice and safety, and it's been a huge benefit for us to work together like that. Um, please don't underestimate the positive power reinforcement. We have found that we have had great successes with ensuring that um, we are acknowledging folks. I think I'm getting short on time, but again, leadership is the key. And just finally to end, um, we do plan to brand our internal safety program. Um, a lot of the SPS network hospitals do this and, and we've been a bit delayed in doing that, but we're, we're, we're almost there. We're focusing to continue to grow our safety coach program. Uh, we are focusing now on executive leadership round and operational leader rounding the influence, advancing our collaboration with our family leadership council. They are obviously a key piece to all of this. And we are continuing the adoption and spread of the hospital acquired condition prevention bundles. And lastly, um, but not least, is that we do need, we recognize to improve our strategy for sharing our results, the great results we've seen in our data uh, with frontline staff. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jane. Great presentation. Really an emphasis on culture there and how important that is. So really, thanks for uh, thanks for that. All right. So we're now going to go over to our uh, friends at CHEO, uh, Dr. David Creary and Jennifer Ellis, uh, to talk about their experience with SPS. Over to you guys. Hi there. Thank you very much. So I'm Jennifer Ellis. I'm the Director of Quality and Safety at CHEO, and I'm a registered nurse. Hi, Dr. David Creary. I'm the Medical Director of Patient Safety, and I work in the Pediatric ICU. 
So uh, we'll give you a little bit of a background on CHEO. So CHEO was founded in 1974, and we are a standalone academic center in Ottawa, and it is always frozen here. Uh, we serve more than 5,000 children and youth, uh, 500,000 children and youth from Nunavut to Northern Ontario and Western Quebec, and uh, we are about 167 beds. We have 6,700 missions, 7,700 surgeries, um, upwards close to 80,000 visits to our emergency department right now, and about 180,000 visits to our outpatient clinics. The name of our programming for our uh, solutions for patient safety work and our safety work in general is Safety First. Um, safety first is one of the key priority indicators for our organization. Uh, it includes occupational safety as well, so you can see that violence in the workplace is one of our key safety metrics as well. Um, CHEO has had a long history of quality improvement, so we started our quality improvement work actually in 2008, but we became a Tata Care institution in 2011. So our decision to join um, Solutions for Patient Safety was, was not a difficult one for us. In fact, it was uh, very much in line with a lot of our, our history to date. Um, you've heard descriptions of what a high reliability organization and CHEO is also embarking on this journey and has, a has made a commitment to become a high reliability organization. So our goal is to foster a predictable and consistent workplace, depend on standardized systems that uh, are well developed, and to help improve uh, and learn as we go. So we are a continuous learning organization so that we can deliver safe, reliable care with high quality results. Yeah, and just to pause for a sec, many of the things that we were planning to say, uh, which shows the, the beauty of the network really, are things that others have said already. So we'll, we'll try not to repeat what others have said before, but we were very much in agreement with uh, many of our slides are exactly the same as what the previous two speakers have addressed. Yeah, and we've, we've reduced some of them because there is so much um, Overlap, consistency, yeah. which is really great actually. It just talks about the strength of joining uh, a network such as Solutions for Patient Safety. Not allowing me to switch. I just tried. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Great. So um, as we began, so back in 2016, before we joined Solutions for Patient Safety, we weren't really sure about what approach we wanted to take. We saw some of our peers kind of jumping off the dock, which you know looks fun. Uh, but we, we decided that for us, perhaps we would take a bit more of a staggered approach, pr pretty consistent with what you heard from IWK and others as well. So we slowly waded in. I'm using David's analogy he uses quite consistently. And, I, and I'd say that um, you know, after joining in 2006, I feel like this, I think we described this as, a, as to where we are right now in our SPS journey. Yeah, and I, I think there's there's pros and cons to each of these. I mean, it's, it's a little bit like a big bang go live with an EHR versus uh, bringing it in in different uh, clinics. The problem, I guess, is that we left some safety improvements uh, behind because we didn't jump off the pier. But um, referring to an EHR, we went live with Epic uh, for inpatients in 2017. And, and the feeling back when we were initially doing our planning around SPS was, we didn't want to um, in any way jeopardize the go live with Epic, so we wanted to do it in a, in a stepwise manner, which is why we're, we're waiting in. I think we're probably mid, mid belly or lower chest by now, probably. So th this picture here would describe our, um, our journey to date. So again, we onboarded in 2016 of March. Uh, and in the first year, we focused a lot of our efforts around uh, our culture work, so our safety governance, uh, our safety culture, and as well as um, two uh, health acquired conditions, which is the central line bloodstream infection and adverse drug events. Um, adverse drug events was an easy one for us because, as David mentioned, we were bringing, bringing in a new electronic health record, and one of our interventions would have been barcoding of drugs, so we felt this was a, a good focus. And for CLABSIS, we did um, an environmental scan as well as an internal scan to select uh, CLABSI as one of our initial hacks. Um, speaking with our, looking at what we've learned to date and with our peers, we do feel that CLABSI was, was a good choice for us, even though it's a very challenging um, health acquired condition bundle to, to tackle. In our second year, we continued our work with our, our culture work, but we started to focus more on leadership methods and uh, we brought in a stronger focus of employee and staff safety. I will note that since 2016 and since joining Solutions for Patient Safety, we've always had um, occupational safety in our safety metric, and we've always had a commitment to occupational safety in all of our work. So we we've, we came out the gates as a 
safety for both occupational and patient safety. So we continued in year two with, uh, the, as I mentioned, leadership methods, and we, we expanded our health acquired conditions to include surgical site infections. Uh, we are, we're a news club organization, and we started to do some work with antimicrobial stewardship. In our third year, uh, we are focusing, we're reinforcing the culture work that's been done to date. We're, we're starting our air, we've started our air prevention training and we're building on our safety coach program. Uh, and in terms of our health acquired conditions, I'll show you another slide in a minute that shows kind of where we are with a number of our health acquired conditions, but we've expanded this list as well. So just want to take a minute to share what the, um, what the regional or the Canadian goals are for solutions for patient safety. So uh, as, much, as much as other organizations have their work plan for the year, us as a collective actually have a, a work plan for Canada, which is to achieve 80% reliability with the application of a culture tool, um, to reduce regional collapse by 10%, and to achieve 80% uh, reliability bundle for unplanned extubation. There's also goals to share a site visit for peers, uh, to host a conference, and to share patient or staff stories at every leadership meeting. So very consistent with some of the other diagrams you've seen, but this is a, a depiction of our, um, our program of work for our hospital-acquired conditions. Um, and you can see that we've got cloud seen adverse drugs and readmissions all along the side and, and very similar to what you've seen in some of the other, with the other presenters. This is the depth of what we're hoping to achieve for this year. So the shade behind is where we hope to go and the colored box is where we currently are. So for example, we are submitting process data for cloud seen or adverse drug events or surgical site infections, but for some areas, we are really just still um, submitting outcome data or we are learning about the actual health acquired condition bundles themselves. We've replicated this slide as it relates to our culture work as well. So we're continuing to work on our safety governance. We, we do ascribe to the same cause analysis techniques that you've heard from the other presenters as well. So root cause analysis, apparent cause analysis, and common cause analysis. Uh, we're building on our, we've, we're making um, gains in our air prevention training and our leadership methods and some of the other culture work you can see along the side. So this diagram is to depict kind of our intentions for the year and what our current progress is. Um, I won't cover the information in this slide, but I do want to show um, through our, our network, we're able to see how we perform. Now, this data is not meant to be truly benchmarkable, but it's meant to allow us to compare ourselves um, at a high level or to see where there's opportunities or how other areas or other groups perhaps are performing as it relates to some of this, the common challenges of certain health acquired conditions. So we get this data from participation in solutions for patient safety. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about culture. Uh, so health acquired, health acquired condition bundles are not a new thing in healthcare, but I think what SPS really brings, which hasn't been very prominent in the, in the pediatric environment in particular for safety, is culture work. And, you'll, and many of you may hear the common adage that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So it's really important to have a strong safety culture in your organization. So some of what you've heard in the past from the other presenters, we've also uh, replicated here at CHEO. So we also have huddles and we have leadership methods five to one feedback, stat sheet exchanges. We have a daily brief across the organization. We use safety stories in our meetings. And here's an example of um, how we convey some of our serious safety events. We will show pictures of the individuals or we will tell their story. We do root cause analysis and common cause analysis and apparent cause analysis. We have error prevention safety habits. We have safety coaches that's starting and we're rounding to influence as well. This is just an example of, uh, again, how we've conveyed some of our serious safety events and how we use, uh, we're, we are using patient stories and when we have their pictures or when permission or video, we are also using videos to tell our stories. This is just also an example and if anyone's interested, we can share this information along. This is a poster we presented at to one of the SPS conferences, which just talks about how in addition to using root cause analysis or common cause analysis, uh, or parent cause analysis and our review methods, we've also started to use simulations. So we've had a few situations where uh, we've had an event where we felt that we had identified the contributing factor and put in the corrective action. And as we um, decided to simulate the corrective action, we found that perhaps that uh, wasn't as robust as, as we intended and the, the event still happened. So we went back to the drawing boards until we found a new um, a new solution. So we are starting to use simulation where possible in our uh, root cause analysis. 
this is just an example, as others have mentioned, about the daily brief. So we, we don't call it a daily safety brief, but we have a daily brief across the organization that gives us situational and safety awareness, and it's uh, well attended and happens 365 days a year. It only takes us 15 minutes, but it gets us all caught up pretty quickly. We also have good catches and a good catch award program. Um, and uh, we've even had our safety ambassador, uh, so a volunteer, uh, be awarded a, a good catch award as well. The safety ambassador informed our families about our early response, our SPOT team, and uh, the individual ended up using it. So, so it's great. So we're recognizing, we've recognized staff, patients, uh, as well as volunteers in our good catch award. As others have mentioned, we are also bringing in a safety coach program and our error prevention training. We call it Safety First Habits, and we're bringing in our safety coach program, and the goal is to make safety a habit. So we're trying to teach behaviors that are so um, second nature that they're actually habits, and these are the behaviors and the habits that we are teaching this year and promoting this year. I recognize we're quite short on time, so I'll just push through a little bit faster. Um, so David, I don't know if you want to summarize some of the benefits that you'd say that we, we've we um, achieved through being an SBS hospital. Yeah, we, we haven't really used the term SBS. If you, if you went around the, the, the wards of GEO and asked if people know what SBS means, they, they might or they might not, but they certainly know about safety first. We see SBS as a key driver that helps us to push forward with our safety first um, program, and it's, it's really been valuable in convincing the senior team and board that, that we're not making this up as we go along. We're part of something bigger, and we're part of an evidence-based and proven uh, group that, that actually does reduce and hopefully will eliminate harm to, to kids. So it, it's been a huge plus being part of SBS. It's been nice to have um, bench, you know, not true benchmarkable, but benchmarking light data to also help us understand where we can reach out to some of our peers who have been having some successes in, in their efforts towards, you know, harm reduction of cloud seas or surgical site infections. So in the sense, it truly is a knowledge network for us. It, it's got a, the, the right pediatric focus, which is hard to find for certain um, quality and safety improvements. And, and back to the positive pressure and the, and the focus, as Dave mentioned, you know, there are a lot of ideas in safety science or a lot of things we can do. The beauty of this has been having a very consistent approach, and you can see from the, diff from the different presenters as well that we've all been very consistent, and that's actually creating a bit of a, a safety standard across the organizations that we're all applying. So, it's, so the focus has been helpful, and it's, it's been a really wonderful experience to date. So to summarize, our, our key commitments is really to reduce preventable harm through increasing high reliability and ultimately to enhance safety so that our clients can have to, um, a reduction in preventable harm and truly the best life possible. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, again, a great presentation. Really, you get, uh, between the three of you, really showcasing the, 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 the breadth of what SPS does. And I, and I get the sense that that's not even the entire breadth. That's really just a little slice. So there's lots more to... Lots more to potentially learn. So just my chance to uh, remind the audience, if you do have any questions, we are a little bit over time, but we can certainly uh, stick around for a couple minutes to answer uh, a couple of questions if you have them. Uh, the one question that came in, uh, and maybe uh, David and Jennifer, we can start with you on this. Someone was asking if there is a, uh, a pediatric early warning score or a PUSE score or a similar type system that SPS recommends that the network hospitals use. So I'm not aware of one. No, that that hasn't been a big push um, that I'm aware of at SPS, but that certainly is a is a is a big factor in in some of the hospitals across Canada. But I haven't heard pews um, or other early warning systems being part of SPS. But it's a great uh, it's a great suggestion. Barbara Jane, are you familiar with anything like that that you've heard of as part of SPS? Yeah, no, I haven't either. Yep. No, not part of SPS, but certainly back to the culture piece. It certainly did when you know when we started, um, you know, improving upon our safety program um, and doing root cause analysis. And an output of that was that we we have um, implemented um, a PUS system um, in our pediatric inpatient unit. So again, it while it's not a formal part of the um, uh, suite of hospital acquired condition bundles offered, it. By virtue of the culture work we're doing, it got us to a place where that's where we've gone. All right. The, the other question I had was around uh, the whole concept of getting to zero, zero, zero errors as being a, a goal. I mean, uh, Jane, you talked so extensively about culture. I think everybody gets that 
you know, uh, patient safety is important, but we're health, healthcare is so accustomed to working with acceptable risks, whether it's yeah. uh, side effects of a drug or surgery or what have you. How hard yeah. is it to get people to think that zero is a realistic goal for anything like this? Um, so from my perspective, and this is just my perspective here at the IWK, um, it varies depending on the groups that you're talking to. I think that perhaps a misstep that we made um, early on in our journey is that we were focusing a lot on the use of the word zero. Um, and as you've already said, as we have a, a we've had a culture in healthcare where we accept risk and we think things are going to happen. That's really the key piece: is how do you undo that thinking? Um, and yes, there are known complications of of clinical disorders. Uh, yes, there are. It is very difficult to say that you're going to have absolutely zero preventable harm. But what we've focused on is at least trying to get to zero serious patient harm. Um, and as I said earlier, um, we've been quite successful at um, realizing uh, realizing that. Now, will that stay forever? We've been at zero for this fiscal year. Uh, be nice to think that's a forever and a day thing, but, but we shall see. But I would caution um, for sure around... Um, overuse of zero. It depends on where you're at culturally within your organization. But that did backfire a little bit for us. Now we're in a very different place. Um, but initially, that, to your point, was very hard for people to reconcile. Do you have any thoughts or any experience around around that issue of, of getting to zero and whether you had, as, as Jane said, any, anything backfire on you when when taking that approach? Yeah, it's Barb. I think the other way is what kind of zero are you talking about? I mean, we use, you know, if we have a month on one unit where there's no CLAB C, then we celebrate that zero. So there are lots of small zeros where, um, and then people get excited about, well, you know, we've made it a month. Well, maybe we can make it another month, right? And so it really is an opportunity to not how, it's really not the language of we want to be at zero and we want to be perfect. We we know, everyone knows that's not possible because we are human and we have that discussion in the culture and error prevention training as well. But I think it really is, you know, how can you use it more in a journey as opposed to an ending? I don't know. I would agree Hi. with that. Hi, it's Jen and David here too. And we would emphasize too that the focus is about zero preventable harm, right? So it's it's not just zero harm, it's harm that really could have been preventable. And SPS is very wise in its definitions of how we measure um, certain outcomes and what a harm outcome is. Our board had committed to a serious safety event rate of zero. And that, that took, um, that, that was really remarkable and there were a lot of discussions around it. But we, we did want to share that CHEO made it to 347 days early in this journey to um, 347 days without a serious safety event. So we do feel that, it, you know, zero is attainable. I don't know if it's sustainable all the time, but we definitely feel it's attainable. Yeah, I would just add that, I mean, philosophically, it felt wrong to us to say we accept a certain amount of preventable harm, even if the goal of getting to zero is maybe unattainable. So it was almost a philosophical aspirational goal. But we've demonstrated our an ability to get quite close there, so we're confident that we can do it. All right. Well, thank you for that. We, one last question. And Barb, since you did the intro to SPS, maybe we can ask you this one. Um, someone's asking, how can community hospitals with large pediatric volumes partner with CPS? Is, it, is there, is there a, an opportunity to directly be part of SPS or perhaps through a partnership with a tertiary center? Um, so certainly there are throughout the U.S. centers that are much smaller and they are members of SPS. So reaching out to SPS directly for details around that um, is something I would suggest. And at this point, I, you know, some of, again, some of the larger organizations are starting to look at, you know, how how can you support um, regional partners? And, and so, again, I think SPS is open when you think about what their mission, mission is um, to uh, any other ideas. I think with that, I think it's uh, time to wrap up as we are a little bit over time. I do want to thank all of you for a great presentation. I did want to mention that uh, Children's Healthcare Canada is partnering with SPS. Uh, we used to have a substantial sort of 
uh, patient safety program, a collaborative, et cetera. We've essentially sort of, that's all sort of disappeared a bit. And, and our role at Children's Healthcare Canada, as far as it comes to patient safety, is really about partnering with SPS and promoting the work there. So I think we're going to see, we're going to be seeing more uh, webinars from SPS in the, in the future or from our, from our Canadian uh, hospitals that are participating in SPS. So there's lots more to come. So thanks to all of you for, uh, for the great presentation. Thank you. All right. And now I'm going to bring back my co-host, Lucas, to help us close it out. Jennifer and David, you weren't here for the intro, but today is uh, National Child Day. So I've got uh, Lucas, my son, here helping uh, co-host the, uh, the the webinar. He did actually think his favorite part was the uh, the daily briefs. He thought that was an awesome way to uh, do that. But, uh, anyways, uh, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual microphone over to uh, Lucas to close it off for us. Thank you. We do our webinar webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It's always great if you watch live as your questions and comments really enrich the discussion. But if you can't watch live, the recordings of these sessions are made available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network at www.kenchildrenshealthcarecanada.ca. Next week on November 27th, we will have an interesting presentation in partnership with Skip. Solutions for Kids in Pain, titled, Man titled Managing Pain and Distress in Children Undergoing Brief Diagnostics and Therapeutic Procedures. This session will have Evelyn Trottier from Diagnostic and Therapy from Chou Saint Justine in Montreal and Chris Krista Berg from Jim Pattison Children's Hospital in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. They will present the new position statement from the Canadian Pediatric Society that focuses on managing acute pain in infants, children, and youth who are undergoing common, minor, but painful medical procedures. Sign up for our Children's Healthcare Canada Spark newsletter and stay up to date on all of our activities and events. Thank you very much, Lucas, for helping me co-host today on National Children's Day. Thanks to uh, our presenters again and everyone who joined us. And thanks to uh, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals for supporting our webinar program. And hopefully we'll see everyone back here for our webinar next week. Bye, everyone. Bye.